All right, so questions on uh, 5.2. So this is 5.2, we're gonna do a binomial. I should label that every time, binomial distributions. So what we need to know about a binomial dis probability distribution, it is just a specific type of um, probability distribution. In the very first section, what they give you is, a lot of times they give you a table, right? They give you x, which is numerical, then they give you p of x, where the sum of it's equal to one, and they're all in between zero and one. So those are your three uh, conditions for a probability distribution. Um, in the binomial distribution, essentially, we have to, we're, we're, given, we're given x, because we're given the, the sample size, we're given n, so you know it's gonna be it's from zero to that. <coughs> and um, we have to hand calculate p of x. So p of x comes with that formula that, that, uh, that comes on our formula sheet, the, the probability distribution formula. So again, when you guys have a test, and you guys are looking for um, your formulas, remember that the sheet that I give you is labeled by chapter, right? So there's chapter three, chapter four, and down here is chapter five. And you can see that this p of x is equal to n factorial over n minus x factorial times x factorial. What does that, that mess actually represent? What's a quick formula for this? For this piece right here? What's a quick formula for that piece? N choose x, right? Yes. So you can just write that as N choose x times p to the x times q to the n minus x. So you don't have to do that formula by hand. We can just do N choose x here. So you're welcome to write there. You can say that this is n choose x times p to the x times q to the n minus x. So if you want to write that instead, because it's an easier looking formula, you're welcome to do that, okay? Our calculator has that n choose x button. You might as well use it. <clears throat> All right, so uh, number two says, uh, assume that we want to find the probability that when five customers are randomly selected, Exactly two of them are comfortable with delivery by drones. Also assume that 42% of customers are comfortable with drones. Identify the values N, X, P, and Q. Okay. How cool would that be, right? Just give me my package, all right? So what it says is um, when we know N, then we have X and then we have P, and then we have Q. These are the things that we need to identify, right? So let's start out with the first sentence. It says, we want to find the probability that when five customers are randomly selected, exactly two of them are comfortable with delivery. What does the five and the two represent? Remember what N represents. N represents what? <coughs> yeah, the number, of, the number of tries, right? It remembers the total, doesn't it? How many people are there? Five. Five people total. How many do I want to test? How many do I? How, am I, how many am I asking? Two. Two are comfortable. We're asking if two are comfortable. Does that make sense? So the sample is five, and we're asking the probability of exactly two. So we're actually asking p of two eventually. Identify the value. So uh, I need to know p, and I also need to know q. So it says also assume that 42% of customers are comfortable with drones. So where does the 42% go? What does p represent? The probability of Success, right? And in this case, we're saying comfortable drones is success. So I don't want you to write 42%. I want you to write 0.042. Is that clear? Because this is the number that we're going to be plugging into the formula. If you type 42 in there, it's not going to give you the right thing, is it? This needs to be a percentage. So it needs to be a decimal equivalent. So what does that make Q? Yeah, it's going to be if you're either comfortable or you're not comfortable, right? That's what we mean by a binomial distribution. You're either success or failure, whatever you define success. So this is going to be, um, well, the way you can do it by hand is just 1 minus 0 0.42, which you could probably do in your head, which is 0 0.58. Does that make sense? They're complementary, so you just subtract it from 1. So I know uh, n, x, p, and q. Uh, does it ask us to find the probability? No. Well, we're going to do it anyway. Well, what's the probability of exactly 2? Well, we know the formula is going to be n choose x. Let me put x here, and then we'll, we'll fill in the blanks. n choose x times p to the x times q to the n minus x. That's our formula, right? We might as well find it. Since we have all the information, let's just practice plugging it in. So P of 2, what's N again? 5. five. Choose, what's X? Two. 2. Times P, which is? 0 0.042. To the what? Uh, two. To the 2. Times Q, which is? 0.58. 0.58. Ti uh, raised to the what? 
Okay, make sure to put that thing in parentheses. If you don't put it in parentheses, well, it kind of depends on your calculator. If your calculator like sticks things up in an exponent, it actually looks like an exponent, then you don't need parentheses. But if your calculator has a caret instead, you have to have parentheses, okay? What's nice is if you put parentheses in either calculator, it'll always work. So that's what I say, just put parentheses in and then we don't have to worry about it. So I'll type it into the calculator, Let's see if you guys get the same thing. So I have, um, what we have is five and then math, and we're gonna go to probability down to choose, and then go to two, multiply by 0.42 raised to the x, which is two. See how I'm up in the exponent? Yes. So I have to press right to get it out of the exponent, right? So I press the right tab, and then times 0.58, Raised to that. I'm going to put parentheses around it anyway, okay, just to, just to get used to it. Because when we do this on our uh, table, remember we do this on the table as well, you have to add parentheses on the table because it uses a caret. So this is going to be n minus x, so 5 minus 5 minus 2. And we're done. We have, um, remember, 3 sig figs, so 0 0.344. So this is 0 0.344. So there's a probability that if I, if I randomly choose five people, and I know that 42% of the people, the population actually is comfortable with drones, drones, that means if I randomly select five people, there's a 34.4% chance that two of them are comfortable with it. Exactly two of them are comfortable with it. Does that make sense? What's kind of funny is the exactly two doesn't really become very useful Better questions we like to ask is, because um, if, you're, if you're Amazon, you don't really care about exactly two. What you really want to know is if two or more are comfortable. Does that make sense? You really want to, you want everybody to be comfortable because you want to do this, right? So the way you do two or more is you have to find the probability of three, P of three, P of four, and P of five, and then add those things together. That'd be a more relevant question. But the probability of exactly one thing happening is always going to be relatively small. Is that clear? The biggest number that you're going to get is, remember, the probability of success was 42.42. And if you did 2 out of 5, like 2 divided by 5, that's a pretty close number, isn't it? 0.4 and also that. So when this number is really close to your prob probability, you're going to get a higher probability. The reason why that's the case is, let's, let's find the mean. Why we're, we're, uh, why we're at it. Um, Let's go ahead and find the mean and the standard deviation. How do you find the mean and the standard deviation of a, of a probability distribution? I mean, sorry, of a binomial probability distribution. Well, the formula is n, oh, my bad, not that one. Formula for mean is just n times p. And the formula for the standard deviation is the square root of n times p times q. So n is what? 5. 5. p is? 0.42. So we're going to see 5 times 0.42. So I get 2.1. No wonder why that probability was high, right? The mean is, is 2.1 people, right, or adults or whatever. They, let's just say peeps. Okay. So no wonder why P of exactly 2 is a high number because the mean is 2, or at least close to it. And then if I do um, second square root of um, uh, 5 times 0.42 times 0.58, you get uh, 1.1, so this is equal to 1.1 people. So that means our usual values, I know I keep doing this over and over again, but this is something we just comes up so often, okay? The usual values would be your mean minus two times sigma to the mean plus two times sigma, right? This represents significantly low, this one represents significantly high, right? Anything beyond those are going to be significantly low and significantly high. So 2.1 minus 2 times 1.1 to 2.1 plus 2 times 1.1. So what I get is I get a negative 0 0.124.3 people. So it's kind of interesting is with all this information, you can determine how many people would be comfortable with drones. So out of the numbers from uh, zero through five, how many people are comfortable? Is zero people comfortable with drones? Is it in this list right here? Is it in this range? Yeah. Because remember what we have here is this is a discrete probability distribution. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. So zero, one, two, three, four, five. I know that P of two is actually, you know, P of two, if I was going to look at that, that is going to be 0 0.344, right? I don't, I'm not calculating them all, okay? What you'll notice is binomials tend to have a bell-shaped curve centered at its mean. It's bell-shaped-ish, so. Um, what I know is that the usual values go from this to this, right? So all these values in here, zero is the usual value, one's the usual value, two's the usual value, three's the usual value, four's the usual value, right? So if you want to know how many people are comfortable with drones, well, zero, three, four. You probably won't get all five people. Does that make sense? I, I, I know I went much farther than that than I asked, but what was only asking was this number here, right? That's the only thing it was asking. But we're going to be asking more of this, so the more familiar we'll get with it, it's going to be okay. All right, um, number three, it says uh, independent events. So based on um, based on a Pitney Bowes survey, when uh, 1,009 customers were asked if they were comfortable with drones delivering their purchases, 42% said yes. Consider the probability that amongst 30, 30 different consumers randomly selected from 1,009 who were surveyed, there is at least 10 who are comfortable with drones. Given the subjects surveyed were selected without replacement, are the 30 selections independent? Well, how do you know if something's independent? What tells us in this sentence that they're independent? Without yeah, without replacement, right? Since they're done without replacement, we know that they are... Um, they are dependent, not independent. What do you mean? Oh yeah, without yeah, without replacement, right? Since they're, since they're done without replacements, they are um, they are um, they are dependent. Yep. Does that make sense? Because your sample is getting smaller every single time, so your probabilities are changing, right? So the denominator of that is going to change, yep. just like what we had before. Can they be treated as independent? What we have to ask is 30 people below that 5%. Remember that, uh, that, uh, that guideline we said? So what we have to do is we have to take 30 and divide it by 1,009 and see if that's below 5%. And it is, isn't it? So since that's below 5%, even though the denominators are changing, if you calculated the probabilities as dependent and if you calculated the probabilities as independent, where you left the denominator, it's the same you'll notice that the value would actually be, it would be so close that it doesn't matter. Does that make sense? Remember when you guys did the test question? Um, like the answer was 0 0.0167 and the other one was 0 0.0168. Notice how they were very small? It's because that number was almost below 5%. It was just slightly above, so. Number nine, okay, so. What they're asking here is they want to know um, if it's a binomial distribution or not. So really the, the, the biggest thing we're looking to be satisfied here, mostly in these questions, is um, um, is the outcome two different outcomes? You know, is it a yes and a no? Is it a success and a failure? Does that make sense? They don't usually ask too much about independence here. So they don't say without replacement or with replacement most of the time, but mostly we're looking to see if there's two outcomes because that's really what binomial means, by meaning two. All right, so number nine says, Senate members in the 11th Congress include 80 males and 20 females. 40 different sen uh, uh, senators were selected without replacement, and the gender of each senator was recorded. Oh, I guess I lied then about that without replacement thing. Without replacement means they are... They're dependent, right? So to be a binomial distribution, we have four different things, right? Let's see if I can have to write it down. Maybe I can just protect it. Oh, I didn't bring it. I'm dumb. All right, let me see if I can just find it here so I don't have to write them all down. So definition of a binomial distribution says that we have a fixed number of trials. Essentially, this is our n, right? So in the previous example about drones, n was equal to 5, so it's fixed. The next, the trials must be independent. 
Does that make sense? Uh, next, we have to have all outcomes have to be classified into two categories, either success or failure. And also, the probability of success must be the same for all trials. So it means that probability can't change. That P number can't change. But since this is without replacement, what we know is it's dependent, so it fails one of them. It actually did have two outcomes. You guys agree? Like a senator is either male or female? Okay. Um, 13. So in exercise 13 and 14, answer the questions designed to help you understand the rationale for binomial probability uh, formulas. Oh, this is a good one. Okay. So this is... Um, they're trying to give us to understand why that formula is that formula, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it by hand, and then I'm going to use the probability, I'm going to use the binomial formula, and I'm going to show you that we get exactly the same answer, okay? And I, at least you have an idea that that formula is not just taken from a hat. It actually makes sense as far as it's, as far as it's how it's done. So as a standardized test such as ACT or SAT uh, or a medical college administer MCAT, typically use multiple choice questions, each with five possibilities, A, B, C, D, E with uh, one in which are, is correct. Assume that you guess the answer to the first three questions. Okay, so it says use the multiplication rule to find the probability that the first two guesses are wrong and the third is correct. So what they're asking for is that is find P of wrong, wrong, correct, where W, you know, is wrong and C is correct. Okay, so what they're asking for is they want to know What's the probability of wrong, wrong, correct? Now, I wish they would have wrote it this way. What's the probability of wrong, or wrong, and wrong, and correct? Does that make sense that these things are consecutive events? That the questions are ha happening over and over? So it's like um, picking a card twice, so you know that's why it's the multiplication rule, right? And means what? Good, so this is going to be, and remember that the, that these events are independent, right? One answer from the first does not affect the second, does not affect the third, right? So these things are independent events, so this is just going to be P of wrong times P of wrong times P of correct. Is that clear? Okay. So since there is an A through E, remember that our questions, our questions have um, A comma B comma C comma D comma E, right? They said one of them is correct, right? Mm -hmm. So let's ask ask the question. What's the probability of correct? One out of, five. one out of five, right? So what would the probability of wrong be? Is that clear? There's only one correct answer, so there are four wrong answers, right? So the probability of being wrong is going to be four out of five. Probability of being wrong is four out of five, and the probability of being correct is going to be one out of five. So we get is we get 16 out of 125 when we multiply across, which is going to be... 16 divided by 125. I don't want to round too much. Good. It's three sig figs already, so 0 0.128. Next, what it says is, beginning with wrong, wrong, correct, find a complete list of the different possible arrangements of two wrong answers and one correct answer. Then find the probability of each in that list. So there's more than one way to get two wrongs and a right. You guys agree? You guys agree it's just like the boy, girl, girl, and girl, boy, boy, and so on? Mm -hmm. So this was part A for number 13. So part B says, well, you can do wrong, wrong, correct, which is what we've done. You can do wrong, correct, wrong, and you can also do correct, wrong, wrong. Does that make sense? Those are your three different outcomes. I think in this it says find the probability of each, right? Do you guys agree that, that the probability of wrong, wrong, correct should be the same as the probability of wrong, correct, wrong? Because we're multiplying here, right? And since we're multiplying, does this order actually matter? No. So we know that the probability of wrong, wrong, correct is going to be, you know, it's, it's 4 over 5 times 4 out of 5 times 1 over 5. And the probability of, of um, wrong, correct, wrong is going to be uh, uh, wrong is 4 out of 5 times 1 out of 5 times 4 out of 5. And same thing with the probability of, um, of correct, wrong, wrong is going to be equal to 1 out of 5 times 4 out of 5 times 4 out of 5. And since multiplication is commutative, we know these answers are going to be this incomplete, right? What they're trying to do is they're trying to guide you to a probability distribution to show you what this really means. It's a probability distribution because um, you're either right or wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Or I'm going to call correct success and wrong failure in this case, because it, not not because it's 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 usually the way we define it, but um, the way we should. 
All right. <laughs> All right. So, um, uh, ba okay. So, based on the preceding results, what's the probability of exactly of getting exactly one correct answer when three guesses are made? So let's make let's, let's make sense of this. You guys agree that um that the probability of getting one correct answer kind of depends on the way you guess, right? Mm -hmm. So each one of these represents one correct answer, right? So you either guess this way, or you guess this way, or you guess this way. Is that clear? So the probability of of um one. wrong, let's say, sorry, one, one correct, right? One correct and two wrong is going to be equal to, well, one correct and two wrong is going to be, it's either, you know, it's the probability of two wrong and a correct or wrong, correct, and wrong or correct, wrong, wrong. Is that clear that that makes, does that make sense to you guys? Like you're either this or this or this. You can't be both at the same time, right? And what does or statements mean? What do you, what's the operation? Addition. Yeah, so and statements are addition, or statements are, or, or, sorry, add, and statements are multiplication, or statements are addition. So this is the probability of wrong, wrong, correct, plus the probability of wrong, correct, wrong, plus the probability of wrong, correct, wrong, wrong. So since all these probabilities are the same, this is 0 0.128 plus 0 0.128 plus 0 0.128. So what we get is I get 0 0.384. Is that clear? All right, now what they failed to do, I think, in this section is they should have did a D. They should have said, use the binomial probability distribution formula to determine the probability of exactly one incorrect out of three. Let me make sure that this, 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 this makes sense. I need to, um, let's see if I set this up correctly. Let's see, I'm going to, I'm going to do it on a separate sheet. I just, I need to, I need to think about it. It's been, it's been a year since I've done this. Um, so what we need to know is they're saying the probability of, of one correct, right? I'm probably going to have to do this. I know you guys can't see it, I'm sorry, but probability of one correct is going to be, I'm pausing the video because I, I, want, I don't want you guys to wait five minutes when you're, when you're watching it. So probability wrong is going to be P of exactly one. So I know X is going to be equal to one. What I need to know is what is N? Is N three or is N five? No, N is three. N is because I'm doing this, I got three questions, right? Mm -hmm. And then the probability of success is going to be one out of five, right? So the probability of failure is going to be 4 out of 5. So this is 0.2 and this is 0 0.8. Let me just double check that I get this right and then I can, I can show you what I'm doing. So um, I have three math probability choose one times 0.2 up to the 1 times 0.8 up to the 3 minus 1. Come on, baby. Hell yeah. Okay. So... All right, so um, I think a, a, a last thing to do would have been a D question and say um, what they're asking for is they're asking for the probability of one wrong, I mean one correct. You guys agree? Yes. So this is, they're actually asking for the probability of exactly one. So let's, so what I know is I know that X is equal to one, right? N is how many questions they did, right? How many questions? Three questions. What's the probability of being correct? Yeah, because there's five things up here, right? And only one of them is correct. So the probability of being correct is one out of five, which is 0 0.2. And the probability of being wrong is going to be, which is 0 0.8, isn't it? Does that make sense? So now let's pop that in our probability distribution. So P of one is going to be equal to N choose X times P to the X times Q to the n minus x. Is that clear? 
Does that make sense? This was equal to n choose x times p to the x times q to the n minus x. And what do you think you get when you pop that in? 0 0.384. So what that formula does for you is it takes into account all the possibilities. So it finds, what it does is it, it finds the probability of, you know, of this, and the probability of this, and the probability of this, and then it eventually kind of adds them together. That's essentially what it's doing, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, it's a cool formula, isn't it? This is far more complicated, you guys agree? Yes. Even though you think that formula is pretty complicated, this is worse, right? Yes. Okay, so let's use the formula, because we know it works now. Okay. Uh, number 13. Yeah, they should have put that in there. I think that would have been a, sorry, that was number 13. Uh, number 25. So number 25 says, assume when adults uh, with smartphones are randomly selected, 54% of them in meetings, use them in meetings or classes based on um, LG smartphone survey. So it says, um, if 10 adult smartphone users are randomly selected, find the probability that at least eight of them use their smartphones in meetings and classes. So in this problem, what I want to do is I want to set up a complete probability distribution because I want you guys to do this on a test, okay? And we're going to be able to use our calculator to do it. That was 23. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I need new glasses. <laughs> it's totally true, so... Let me see if this, this will be the same. We're going to do 23. I'm sorry. Because I need this to be on video so you guys can see it, okay? So we'll do... Um, I'm going to do 23 anyway. So what we know from that exercise, it says that... Um, So in 23, um, it says if uh, 10 adult sm smartphone users are randomly selected, what does the 10 actually represent? Remember, we need N, X, P, and Q, right? What does the 10 represent? N, selected. Yeah, that means N, right? That's all of them? You guys agree that's your sample? Okay, so in 23, we know that 10 represents N, right? And I also need to know the probability of success, right? So how many people are going to use a, a smartphone in my class? 54%. I think this is probably a little low, right? Okay, probably a little low. Okay, so the probability of success, which I don't think is successful, but whatever. Remember, it's, it's not, it's, success is just what you define the BP, right? Just the name that we gave it, regardless of if I think it's right or wrong, right? Okay. So that means the probability of um, not success is? 0 0.46, you just subtract that from 1, right? Those two numbers better add to 1. Now, I didn't put x here because I want to create a list for all of them, okay? I want to create an entire probability distribution table, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go x, and then I'm going to write p of x. I want to just fill out the entire table, and I think this will be useful for us. So remember that I have 10 people, and uh, what are the type of outcomes? How many people could use a smartphone? What are the different numbers? Could zero people not use a smartphone? Okay, so zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Is that clear? Intuitively, what's the highest number? Ten. Oh, I bet. What's the highest probability do you think I'm going to get? What number do you think it's going to land on? Fifty-four percent. 0.54 of. 10, right? So it should land somewhere around 5, shouldn't it? That should be your biggest probability. Does that make sense? We'll talk about the mean and the standard deviation in a second here, and I want to see it, okay? That's totally right, yep. Okay, so what we know is for a probability distribution, it's n choose x times p to the x times q to the n minus x, right? That's, that's going to be our formula. Except what's n? 10. So I'm going to write this as 10 instead. 10. Is that clear? Yes. What's P? Okay, so I'm gonna have to write it above. Sorry, I'm gonna write that. I'm gonna keep that as N, I guess, and then I'll and I'll put a, I'll put them up here. So what I know is N is 10. Choose X times 0.54 raised to the X times 0.46 raised to the um, 10 minus X. 
So if I'm going to fill out this table in my calculator, I'm going to go to stats and I'm going to go to edits. And what I want to do is I'm going to press up and hit clear, press up and hit clear. Remember, if you press up and hit delete by accident, L1 disappears. You can hit second delete, which undoes it. So it's empty again and hit second to number one and put your L1 back in there, okay? So we're going to go 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, so there's all my numbers. Now what I want to do is I want to calculate P of X, but I want to do it by hand because there's 11 different numbers there, right? So I'm going to make the calculator do it for me quickly. So the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to press over and then I'm going to press up into L2. Is everybody there? Yes. Anybody not? Okay, then I'm going to hit enter. Now I'm in a formula in L2. I can actually type in a formula. So I'm going to type in that formula. Except what's the only difference between this formula and what I'm going to write in my calculator? Let's take a look at this column right here. This column I labeled X. X. That's right. Yep. Everywhere you see an X, you're going to write an L1, right? So remember that X is equal to L1, okay? So let's pop it in. So N is going to be 10, math, go over to probability, choose. X is again what? 10. L1, L1, second L1, yep. Times 0.54 raised to the, what's X again? L1. L1, second L1. Times 0.46 raised to the, don't forget what? Parentheses. Parentheses. 10 minus, what's X again? L1. L1. Bam. Sound effects help. Enter. So what this is going to do is it's going to generate all your probabilities. Does that make sense? You're welcome to do these all by hand. We just did them, right? We just did some probabilities by hand using this formula. This does it, this basically does it for you. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to fill out the list with those numbers. Notice how um, up here in the number it says 0.42 times 10 to the minus 4, but I need three sig figs. But if you look down here, it actually tells you that number more, right? So it's actually 0.24. I'm oh, sorry, 4.24. So times 10 to the minus 4, which means... Zero with three zeros, and then four, two, four. And I have 0 0.12498, 0 0.0263, three is 0 0.0824. And then you can just press down, and it'll, it'll show you the rest of them. 7 is going to be 0 0.156, 0 0.0689, 0 and then 0.017, that, that 9 is going to turn to an 8, 0, 8, 0, and then I have 0 0.00211. Okay, so I just grabbed those right from my calculator. While we're at it, let's find the mean and the standard deviation. You guys agree I could make a, uh, we're going to do that in a second. You guys agree that I could make a, uh, you could make a histogram of this? And if I did, I can see the highest probability is about 24%, so 0 0.24. So the first one's tiny, right? P of 0 is like really tiny number, so that's going to be a small height. This is also really small, isn't it? So that's another really small number. This is about 2%, which is, you know, kind of small, so I would say there. This one's about 8%, which is going to be a little bigger. It's about a quarter of that, so it's about 8%. Um, next one is, make sure I'm not messing it up, 4 is about 16%. This is 23%. That nah, should have went all the way over to here. These should end on the boundaries. Um, and then a little bit smaller, but not much, 15%. Uh, 6%. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to make the height the actual percentage, right? So if I tab that over, that should be 6%. Or, well, 7%, what's closer to. And then you got about 1%. And then again, very small, right? What does that look like? Does that look like a normal distribution? Yeah. Sure does, right? Remember that if it's a normal distribution where it's symmetric, that mean should be somewhere around here, shouldn't it? Mm -hmm. 
All right, let's calculate the mean. Remember, the mean also should land somewhere around these highest probabilities. You guys agree? Yeah, we'll answer it. Yeah, we'll get there in one second. Yep, absolutely. But you're you're absolutely correct. So the mean is going to be equal to n times p, right? I know I'm I'm doing so much more than what this problem asks. Okay, and Kyle's calling me on it. But uh, <laughs> I want I'm trying to give you guys a deep explanation of what a probability distribution, like what a binomial distribution is. So the only thing they're asking is what you said eight or more, or at, no, at least eight. So it's eight or less, right? Is that no? That's not right. At least eight would be eight or more. You're absolutely right. Yep. So you just add those probabilities, this one, this one, this one. Okay, so we'll get to it. So this is the square root of n times p times q. So um, n times p is going to be 10 times 0 0.54, and this is the square root of 10 times 0 0.54 times um, 0 0.46. So 10 times 0.54. 5.4, yep. And we expected it to be around here. You guys agree? Do you notice how 5 and 6 have the highest probabilities? Yeah. It should be somewhere between them. Probably closer to 5 because 5 is bigger. And it's symmetric. It's a symmetric bell shape. And then the second square root of 10 times 5, 0.54 times 0.46 gives us um, about 1.6. Now, I think this is, uh, this is smartphone users, right? Smartphone users, SPUs, I guess I'll call them. Um, so what are the usual values? So what's significantly low? What's significantly high? Well, you're going to take your mean minus two standard deviations. You're going to take your mean plus two standard deviations. So this is 5.4 minus 2 times 1.6. And this is 5.4 minus, sorry, plus 2 times 1.6. No problem. So what we're going to get is... What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to give you guys an example that'll look just like the test, okay? So 2.228.6 smartphone users. Okay, now let's now let's answer the question that they that they actually asked me to do. <laughs> what they wanted to do is they just want to know what is p of at least eight, right? So what I know is p of at least 8 is p of 8 or 9 or 10. You guys agree? Mm -hmm. So you're going to add up the probabilities. It's p of 8 plus p of 9 plus p of 10. So when I add up these probabilities, 0 0.0689 plus 0 0.0180 plus 0 0.00211. Again, you didn't have to go through all that. I could have just calculated those three and added them up, right? But I still think making the table is just as fast as calculating those three. So when I'm done adding those things up, I want point eight seven one one one. I just want to double check it too. So plus point zero one. What'd you get? Point eight seven one one. Should I get uh, something off a little bit? Double check it, would you? Point I get zero eight nine oh one. Yeah. Okay. Zero point zero eight nine zero one. Okay. So that's the probability. Well, I got to round to the three sig figs, right? Zero point zero eight nine zero. You guys agree? I got a question for you. Is eight a usual value? What's the cutoff that we use for um, for this percentage here? If this percentage is bigger than five percent, we would say that it's a usual value, right? It lives within the the ninety five percent. You guys agree? Mm -hmm. Because what we're doing is we're using a 5% tail, and I need to make sure that it's inside that 5% tail, right? So since this is bigger than 5%, I can say that it's not significantly high or significantly low. It's a usual value. Also, look at the range of the usual values. Does 8 live in here? Yeah. So there's two different ways to look at it. You can see if this percentage is bigger than 5% to see if it's a usual value, or you can take a look at the usual values and see if it's within this range, right? What's kind of neat is if this thing was less than 5%, it would be outside of that range. So that they actually, they, they work together in unison, okay? That's all I have time for this. So uh, if you guys have more questions, we can do um, 